Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Zatarans, now celebrating their 125th anniversary. From WWNO New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker. The art of distilling has deep roots in America. It's a craft learned on the job passed from one master distiller to another. This week, we have the honor of talking turkey. Wild turkey, that is, with Jimmy Russell. He's been making wild turkey bourbon in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky for 60 years. Conversely, Alan Katz is a member of American Distilling's New Guard. We talk gin with Alan, and then Jackie Summers introduces us to Sorrel, a magical sip straight from the Caribbean islands. Let's all belly up to the bar on this week's Louisiana Eats. When Marvin Allen gets off work, his biggest fear is that the police will pull him over and smell alcohol on his uniform. Don't get the wrong idea. It's a work-related problem, not a personal one. You see, Marvin's head bartender at the historic Carousel Bar in the Hotel Monteleon, a position he's held for over 12 years. If you've never tried one of Marvin's signature drinks, you should consider taking a ride at the Carousel Bar the next time you're in the French Quarter. Chances are, you won't be alone. When we stopped in to talk with Marvin on an average Thursday afternoon, he was slammed. With no chance to abandon his post, Marvin spoke to us about life behind the bar, all the while serving drinks for a revolving cast of French Quarter customers. I'm Marvin Allen here at the um, Carousel Bar in the historic Monteleone Hotel. I've been a bartender, head bartender, whatever you want to call me, for um, 12 years. Prior to that, I was at it was the Crown Plaza, now the W Hotel, was there for about 13 years. Prior to that, I was actually in uh, restaurant management. And what had happened, I was extremely burned out. 15, 18 hour days, six, seven, eight days a week. Um, so I decided I was gonna bartend or wait tables six months, maybe a year, then really get back into restaurant management. That was basically 25 years ago, and I'm still behind the bar because I don't think I've grown up yet. I enjoy what I'm doing, having fun. And I also got into bartending at the time when the whole bartending cocktail movement really got started and where we really got out of prohibition and started getting great cocktails again. I've been kind of evolving with the whole movement as it's gone. Well, I imagine you have a great amount of fun working behind that bar at the carousel. I really do because the people come in from all walks of life, all over the world, all over the country. The people that stay here in the hotel, of course, come down. But we get so many more just coming in from the front doors. You'll see uh, different political figures in here, sports figures, um, get music people coming in. It just everybody comes through. Last week, I was up actually up in Michigan, visited three different bars up there. And there were great bars, great restaurants, but they didn't have the ambiance that we did. The bar didn't move, and they actually depended on people to actually drive up, make a point of going there, where here we have people walking by, they'll see it spinning, just pop in. Very unique here. And of course, to-go cups help a lot, too. So where did that carousel come from? How long has it been there? It's been spinning since 1949, and, uh, and it actually was built for the room. The carousel canopy that's over it right now actually was designed after an old European carousel that was put in here in 1992 when they did the first major renovation. People will come in and like, kind of freak them out once in a while, especially if it's like on a uh, Saturday or Sunday morning when they've been out all night drinking. They come in and they're going, oh, I'm going to be sick, I'm going to be sick, or because they think it's moving. And, then I'll get in there and I'll tell them, no, it's not moving. Their friends do the same thing and it really messes with their heads. <laughs> Would you tell us some of your most memorable moments of things that you've seen at the carousel bar? 
There was one where um, there's this gentleman from Sweden, and he was talking to this young lady, and it looked like it was going really, really well. Until all of a sudden she dropped him like a hot potato because her husband was on the other side of the bar watching, and that was their thing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> then there was this one time, this was really funny, there was this um, lady that came in probably in her mid-60s, very, very well-dressed, and you could tell she was dripping with money. And so we're sitting there talking, and finally she says, I need to ask you a question. I said, okay, do you know where Colette's is? And I'm going, man, that sounds familiar, but I can't quite place it. Let me wait on these other people, and I'll get right back with you. And so a few minutes later, I go back. I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I can't place it, but I do know it just sounds really familiar. If you can tell me what kind of food they serve, I might be able to help you. Because a lot of times people come in, they get names wrong, and you kind of figure out from the food everything else. Oh, honey, it's not a restaurant. It's a swingers club. <laughs> I'm going, I have no idea. <laughs> it was the last thing I expected. One night, um, Billy Joel popped in to play the piano. Well, that's pretty exciting. It was. I wasn't here, unfortunately. But two days later, I had something what I think is even more exciting. I came in to set up the bar for work. Alan Toussaint was in here playing the piano. I got a private concert of Alan Toussaint. Doesn't get any better it than doesn't. that. Doesn't <laughs> you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, listen to Alan Toussaint play and sing. He was supposed to be doing an interview, which he did, but the music was even more. I'm like, this is great. When you are working here, do you ever just invent something special for a client? How, how do you go about custom tailoring a special cocktail? Yes, I do. And what happens is somebody comes in, I don't know what I want, things like that. What I start out with is the base spirit. And this kind of go with some flavors that they have, what we have back there. We got you know fresh strawberries, fresh cucumbers, the fresh citrus. So we can do all kinds of fun things. And throughout you know, my experience and stuff of tasting different uh, liquors, I got a good sense of what they taste like, what's going to go with what, and just build it from there. Marvin, shaking a cocktail, it's a, it's a technique that I think for some reason the amateurs, they're a little afraid of the cocktail shaker. Would you explain the proper use of the cocktail shaker? I think they're afraid to do it sometimes because they think it's going to be like that blender accident they had one time. You want to use a shaker and shaking when it's alcohol with a mixer. If you just have plain alcohol, you just want to stir it, like a gin martini, just basically stir it. But the minute you want to put juice or cream or something in there, you want to shake it vigorously to infuse the flavors. Don't be afraid to shake. There are, quote, proper techniques to shake. Basic one is put the top on. If you can pick the top up and the bottom stays on, you've got a great seal. Use both hands to shake. You're done. You're not going to have that blender accident. There will be bartenders that will tell you, oh, yes, you've got to shake it at this particular way for this many minutes and doing it this way because the ice then will dilute, will do this, will do that. Yes, it might, but not enough for the average person to distinguish that. Um, and my philosophy is, too, if you like it, it's good. Have fun. Don't get caught up in the details. If you like what you've created, it's a great cocktail. It doesn't matter if it's five cents or $5,000. You like it, that's all that matters. That's Marvin Allen, head bartender of the Carousel Bar and author of Magic in a Shaker. On any given day, Marvin Allen is ready to make you a View Carré, the Carousel Bar original. But you don't have to travel to the French Quarter for a taste of the exotic. You can pick that up at your neighborhood liquor store, thanks to Jackie Summers, creator of Sorel Liqueur. After a close brush with death, 
Jackie quit his job in corporate America and pursued his heart's greatest desire, a job that included drinking in the daytime. He started making Sorel, a hibiscus liquor reminiscent of the Caribbean-flavored drinks of his childhood. My name is Jackie Summers. I am the creator of Sorel Liqueur and the proprietor of Jack from Brooklyn. I remember as a young child my folks cooking traditional Caribbean dishes in my home and then they would make this drink with the hibiscus flowers and I just thought to myself, this is the best thing ever. I want to drink this all the time. So as an adult, once I realized she could have this delicious drink with alcohol, well, then I just wanted to make it for myself and for my friends and my family all the time. The ingredients of Sorel are no secret. There's Moroccan hibiscus, Nigerian ginger, Indonesian cassia and nutmeg, Brazilian clove, and then I put in pure cane sugar and organic grain alcohol. There are no colorants, there are no flavorants, that is the sum and total of the ingredients. Now what I found out as I researched this was every island in the Caribbean does this slightly differently. And it was all based on how deep you were in the spice route. For example, if you went to Jamaica, they would do hibiscus with allspice and cardamom and orange peel. If you went deeper into the spice route, Trinidad and Tobago, where they have South American influence and Indian influence, then you get nutmeg and ginger and cinnamon. Where my grandparents came from, Barbados, everything was rum. When you source botanicals, what you find out is that it's just like with a grape. It's all about the quality of the soil. So the Moroccan hibiscus, it's an arid climate in a dry soil. The flowers are much more robust and they stand up better in the mix. My feeling was you could get a better representation of what hibiscus really tasted like if it was the star in an ensemble cast. Hibiscus, for people who haven't had it, is very tart, very acidic. It's actually higher in acid than most citrus fruit. But what most people tend to do to compensate for the acidity of the hibiscus is overcut it with sugar. And then it's syrupy and cloying and just not fun. My version of this beverage, which has been around for centuries, has clove on top for brightness. It's got cinnamon notes in the middle for warmth and pepper. The ginger almost perfectly masks the heat of the alcohol. So you never actually taste booze. You just feel booze. And that woody note on bottom and the back, the dry finish, that's nutmeg. So instead of it being a single flavor, it is a procession of flavors. You know, there's a joke I tell people. If mom's apple pie and dad's liquor cabinet got together and got busy, the bastard child would be Sorrel. That was Jackie Summers, creator of Sorel Liqueur. Production's up to a thousand liters a day, so if you can't find a bottle at your neighborhood liquor store, visit Jackie online at jackfrombrooklyn.com. When we come back from a short break, we'll have a visit with the master distiller's master distiller, the legendary Jimmy Russell of Wild Turkey Bourbon. Stay tuned. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. 
Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen and Zatarain. Master distiller Jimmy Russell is a rare bird indeed. He's been making wild turkey bourbon in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky for 60 years. No one else in the industry even comes close to that. At the age of 80, Jimmy Russell holds the distinction of being the oldest active master distiller in North America. Recently, we sat down with the man known as the Master Distiller's Master Distiller to talk, what else? Bourbon. My dad actually started out working for the Old Joe Distilling Company, which was an old distillery in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, and finished up working at the Wild Turkey Distillery. My son, Eddie Russell, is with me now. He he says he's new in the business. He's only been there 33 years now. Most all the people at the Wild Turkey Distillery has been there. Our average length of service right now is about 180 employees. It's 25 years of service, average. It's all tradition, family with wild turkey. We we consider ourselves the traditional f- family way of making wild turkey bourbon. So who was your mentor at Wild Turkey in the early days? Well, Mr. Bill Hughes was a master distiller when I went there. And uh, he was a young distiller for prohibition. And he come back and put the distillery in operation. I wasn't kin to him or anything, but more or less he took me under his wing. I started out in quality control. Quality control back in that day and time is a little different to us now. You know, we'd go get our samples. We'd run tests on the grains of corn, rind, barley, malt, fermenters, and everything we'd run. We might end up up in the grain truck shoveling it out for the days over with. Nowadays in quality control, you go get the samples and you take it to the labs and they do all the analysis there. But back in that day and time, you'd done just a little bit of everything. That's really amazing. So... Tell me, how do you become the master distiller? Well, I tease and cut up all the time. Nobody else would have the job. <laughs> no, it was uh, fortunate that he took me under his wing and started training, and he retired somewhere in the middle 60s. And I took over as master distiller, so I've been master distiller since the middle 60s at the Wild Turkey So distiller. you were less than 20 years on the job when you got that oh, yes, designation. Yes, yes uh uh-huh. How many other master distillers have you trained during your 60 years? Well, uh it's been several of them, but uh, most of them, my son, uh, a couple, three more, uh, some of them is retired now. Four is actually working at the plant, but a lot of other master distillers at other distilleries, I've had a hand in uh, with them, talking to them, and they come to me and ask questions. You know, we're in the bourbon business in Kentucky. We're all close friends. We live with an hour of each other, and we're together all the time and enjoy being with each other, so... I only live six miles away. If I live within a mile where I was born and raised, my wife worked at the distillery before I did. She was in administration then, and she we were married, and she was working there, and I went to work out there. And then when our children come along, she stayed home and took care of the children. So you met her at the distillery? No, we went through school together. Oh, she was your high school sweetheart. My high school sweetheart. That's really, really lovely. I'd like to know about. When you look back over your 60 years in the business, what are the major milestones that you feel like you came to? Well, the thing that I see, uh, you know, basically back when I started, everything was bottled at around 100 proof. We didn't have the lower proof products. Now you have the lower proof, but we're going, I see a big trend going back to the higher proof products. Now, not only in bourbons, but scotches and everything else. But the big trend has been is the small batches, the single barrels and things like that. That's been the biggest trend. And then another thing, you young people. You know, in my age group, old men, they went to their favorite bar in the afternoon, got off of work. They got their bourbon, they got their cigars, and went to the back room and played cards. Nowadays, we we run from 21 to my age. Uh, everybody's drinking. And one of the big things to me is the lady, you ladies. In my younger days, ladies... Unless you're in, maybe here in Louisiana and Kentucky, you didn't go to the bars or anything. You didn't go to the liquor stores. Nowadays, most of the product is bought by you ladies. And I tease and cut up all the time. You made the labels look a lot better. You know, us old men, we knew where our bottle sat on the shelf, and we'd go get it, pay for it, and get home. If you changed position on the shelf, we got home with the wrong bottle. Nowadays, if you're like my wife, the labels look a lot better because you're going to pick it up and look at that turkey. Look at them feathers. How's, what's it say on the back of You read everything on it. Us old men, we didn't pay attention to that. We just want to know what was inside drinking, what was inside that bottle. 
And the export market has been tremendous the last. We're huge in Australia and Japan. Really? Big markets for us uh, back in late 80s, early 90s. So in my beginning, it was a southern gentleman's drink. It's a worldwide drink now. Tell us a little bit about how you make bourbon and the important elements that make a great bourbon great. Well, in bourbons, uh, you know, our federal government tells you how it's the most heavily regulated product in the world. It has to be made from at least 51% corn, has to be distilled under 160 proof, must be put in a new charred oak barrel at 125 proof or less. So in our process, we use less corn and more rye and barley malt. Uh, it gives you more body. more. That's the way traditional old bourbons were made. Uh, your yeast plays an important fact. We have our own yeast at the Wild Turkey Distillery. We make our yeast every day. And all I can vouch for the yeast, it's at least 59 years old. It was there when I got there, and we're still making it, using the same yeast. And uh, some people use corn, wheat, and barley malt, but most bourbon distillers are corn, rye, and barley and there's got, something a little special about that Kentucky water, too. You've got to have good limestone water, good grains, good yeast, and the formless, and we have all that. And a good barrel, very important. We use the number four char, the heavy char. We call it the alligator skin. Our storage buildings are seven stories tall, metal-clad buildings, metal roofs, just rolled in and on ricks. We open the windows in the summertime to get the good air circulation. The wintertime, we close them. We want that barrel to breathe. In the summertime, it expands out into that wood. And when you char in white oak, you're caramelizing the sugars and the vanillas and all. In the wintertime, it extracts in and out. You've got to have that breathing. It's got to move in and out. If it went in that wood and stayed all the time, it wouldn't age. Or if it never got into wood, it wouldn't age. So you've got to have that movement in and out. And the way we age wild turkey, in eight years, we lose about a third of every, every barrel. That, that's what's referred to as the angel share? The angel share. share. we got a lot of happy <laughs> angels around our area. <laughs> I'm sure they are. And sometimes I think it's a little different than that, too. We talk about the single barrels. We call those the sugar barrels. The people that work in those storage buildings all the time knows where the best-tasting barrels are. <laughs> and they always have a little piece of hose laying there and little cups that they always get to taste. We lose a lot more than a third out of those barrels. <laughs> We got a lot of angels working in there. <laughs> what better can you be when you're in the bourbon business and you get to enjoy the life that you'd enjoy? Looking back, you've described the incredible changes that you've seen happen over the last 60 years. If you could look into a crystal ball and project what you think the bourbon industry might be doing in America and abroad, what do you think might happen? Well, I, I look for it to even grow more and more, and I hope so because we're making, you know, we're not making something today to sell tomorrow. We got a plan well in advance at Wild Turkey, eight to twelve years in advance all the time. If we wait up till the time it comes around, we won't have the product. Yeah, uh, that's true. that's happened to us right now in the rye business. Really, rye whiskey is uh, short right now. Straight rye whiskeys, a back seven. Generally, or just wild turkey? No, all rye. Uh, How did that happen? Well, seven eight years ago, us and Jim Beam was about the only two ryes. Rye whiskey is excellent in mixed drinks. And we sort of got away from them, and now we've went back to a lot of the mixed drinks, the cocktails and all, and the rye market shot straight up at one time. And nobody saw that. We was making one or two days of rye a year and 300 days of bourbon. And now I hope the rye market keeps going because we've got a lot of rye whiskey we're putting away right now. Seven, eight years from now, we, we've been on allocations for three or four years. We're still on allocations on our rye whiskey because we didn't see the future that it was going to do that. Well, what what are the trends you see with those micro distilleries? We're better educated now. We call it micro distillery starting up. That's the way all the bourbon distilleries got started. It was little family owned distilleries starting up, and then over the years, and consolidations and buying up by bigger corporations. But all over America, you know, for many years, people thought bourbon could only be made in Kentucky. But Kentucky, a bourbon is a true American spirit, the only spirit in the world of born. Bred, born, and raised in Kentucky, but you can make bourbon anywhere in the United States. Well, I heard that you have been regarded in the industry as the Buddha of bourbon and the master distiller's master distiller. So how do you see your place in America's bourbon world? Well, to me, I just want to be plain old Jimmy like I've always been. I don't want to be uh, up any better than anybody else, uh, we're all the same to me. It's one thing I hope everybody sees me is just 
plain old Jimmy like I've always been. That's what I want to be. Well, plain old Jimmy is surely getting some big honors because, let's see, first of all, uh, it's been declared the year of Jimmy Russell in the bourbon industry. And I'd like to know what it means to you personally that Wild Turkey decided to create a special anniversary bottled bourbon for you, the Diamond Anniversary Bourbon. What does that mean? Well, it's something special. And my son really is the one selected to bourbon for this. He put it together. And then uh, for my 50th anniversary, they done the same thing. But they did. They had me working on the product, and then I thought it was for the company's 150th anniversary. I didn't even know it was for me until the day it was bottled. And now this is my 60th, and Eddie told everybody he selected the bourbon. It's a 13- and 16-year-old bourbon. I've got to give you my personal taste. Most of your bourbons are four and five years old on the market. To me, they haven't matured enough at that age. I think from around six to 12 or 13. I don't like a real old bourbon. We have to use a new barrel every time. And you lose that caramel, vanilla, sweetness. Uh, you get too much real woody taste and all the older it gets. A lot of people like the woody taste. If they do, they like her older. But my personal taste, I don't. And they had the 16-year-old that Eddie had set aside several years ago for my 60th. And then he knew that it was a little too woody for me. So he put some 13-year-old in it to cut down the, the woody taste. And the thing that I'm proud of, being my son, uh, it's got one of the highest ratings it's, I've ever seen. It had a rating of 97 out of possible 100 in a tasting. Actually, the only place you can get it right now is at the distillery. We have, It's been over $100 million spent on the Wild Turkey Distillery in the last five or six years. A new distillery, a new bottle, and new visitor center. And uh, April 15th, we had the ribbon-cutting ceremonies for the new visitor center. So they bottled up a few special cases only for the visitor center, the diamond package. We had visitors from all over the world. All the master distillers showed up that day. I was proud of that. And the governor of the state of Kentucky, they were all our senators, representatives, and everybody was there. So we had a, a great day that day. Been fortunate. I've had a good working relationship with all the governors of Kentucky. Well, this has been a distinct and remarkable honor to have this chance to sit down with you. Thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Invite everybody to come and visit with us. I hope probably you'll come and visit with us. And I hope when you do come by the Wild Turkey Distillery, you'll ask the Visitor Center to, if, if I'm there. I'd be glad to come and show you around. I'd be glad to have you anytime or anybody. I try. That's one thing. It, I said I'm playing old Jimmy. I try to say hello to all the visitors. I know the tours, times, and everything. And I'll try to go be out and say hello to them or go down to the visitor center in the afternoons and sit around and talk to them. I, I enjoy being with the people. Wild Turkey Bourbon's master distiller, Jimmy Russell. I got me a pet in my penthouse. He don't bother me. He ain't no poodle, no pony. Just a little wild turkey and we drink alone. Now that we have master distiller Jimmy Russell's bourbon sitting right next to Jackie Summers' Sorel liqueur, the only thing left to do is make a cocktail. This cocktail is one of Jackie's favorites. He named it The Last Call. Just mix together two parts bourbon with one part Sorel. Swirl the liquors in the glass, mixing the two together, and let it breathe for a minute. Cup the glass between your palms to slightly warm the liquors. Then take a long whiff of the magical scent. The vanilla and honey tones of the bourbon commingle with the cloves, ginger, and flowery hibiscus. Hold your glass up to the light to enjoy the deep, rich ruby color of the last call. It's the perfect ending to any evening, and the way that Jackie Summers likes to end his day. Bottoms up. This is Louisiana Eats. Last call for alcohol. So what you want? I want bourbon. Or Scott. Or beer. If you want to know about what's going on in Shreveport's food scene, just ask our roving reporter, Chris J. Chris, welcome back. I can't wait to hear what's going on up north. Thanks for having me back, Poppy. I love being here. 
So what's happening? Oh, well, I wanted to take you to the Longwood General Store. This place is unlike any other place I've ever been. It's in Blanchard, Louisiana on Highway 169, just outside of Shreveport, kind of almost to Texas. Okay. So um, uh, north and west of Shreveport. But this place is one of those, and don't don't judge it too quickly, but it's a restaurant located inside of a convenience store, okay? So we've, we've been to a million of those in Louisiana. We're really good at those in Louisiana. This one's different. All they do is ribeye steaks, and they're incredibly affordable. A 9-ounce for like $13, a 16-ounce for about 20 bucks, and they're just incredibly well done. You're sitting in this dining room literally in the middle of a grocery store. So you've got, um, you know, your sundries to your left, your toilet paper, your snacks, your cookies all around you, but there's a dining room right in the center of all that. And you can get cocktails there, too. And I'm not making this up. This place is sort of like (laughs) where I'm going to go when I die. Cocktails are about 20 ounces, and they're $3. So, I mean, this is not cure, okay? (laughs) This is maybe not sophistication, but you're going to get big, tall, boozy drinks for about 3 bucks. How long do you think it's been around? It's been there over 30 years. Over 30 years? I only recently discovered it. People kept telling me, have you been out to that store in Longwood? Have you been out to that store in Longwood? It's about a 25-minute drive from Shreveport. But I made the trek, and I've since gone several times just in the last couple of weeks. There's something so free of any pretension there. I'll do that all day long. Well, i got to ask you another question about this. One of the hallmarks of most great steakhouses are the sides. So... What else do you get besides the meat? Most folks, when the steak comes out, you're going to see a baked potato on the platter. And the baked potato is kind of there as a courtesy, you know. You get the feeling that we're all there to engage in this ritual of eating an enormous steak. I mean, they have a 48-ounce steak on the menu, which is completely insane. I've never seen that come out of the kitchen. Like I say, there's not a lot else to go for other than the steaks. A baked potato and a steak is pretty much all you're going to see on a plate. But wow, I was so impressed with how for over 30 years they've just done one thing really, really well. And locals love it. Well, before we leave the convenience store, a lot of great convenience stores in Louisiana also have some unusual things you can purchase on the way out. Any um, gift shopping or unusual snack shopping you can do before you go? Well, I will say there's something to be said. If you want dessert after you've had this enormous, wonderfully done steak, you can just hop over and grab a package of Ho-Ho's, you know? (laughs) I mean, there's something to be said for that. The convenience store being um, the surroundings, it creates an interesting dynamic. If you order a, a Bud Light, they go get it out of a six-pack in the convenience store. (laughs) It's just surreal to me. Um, There are all of these hunter's trophies mounted in the dining room, so bass and turkeys and deer. It's very rural. But I would encourage people to go. It's just so unique. And uh, it's right next to uh, Lead Belly's grave. If you have any interest in the blues, you're right down the street from the burial site of Huddy Ledbetter. Well, let's go on a blues and steak pilgrimage. Let's do it. We may never come back. We may just (laughs) drink those $3 cocktails for the rest of our lives. Amen. Thank you, Chris. (laughs) Please come back soon. It's my pleasure, Poppy. Thank you for having me. Chris J., our Louisiana Eats roving reporter. What's the proper way to flambe? Don't go anywhere. We'll answer that question when we come right back. Well, I've been turnstile, junk pile, and railroaded to. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Rouse's Markets. Here's this week's culinary quiz question brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Culinary Institute. What's the proper way to flambe? The most important thing is not to pour the liquor straight from the bottle into the hot pan. The alcohol can catch fire so quickly it can travel up the stream of liquor into the bottle, making a Molotov cocktail. That will ruin your dinner party. 
Instead, pour the liquor out into a separate container before adding it to the pan. If you're cooking on a gas flame, tilt the pan towards the fire, and within a few seconds, the alcohol should ignite. Another easy method is to pour the liquor into a ladle and heat it until the evaporation begins. Those wispy tendrils of steam are easily lit with a match. The real showstopper? Toss a pinch of cinnamon into the flames and you'll have some real fireworks. I'm Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats. I jump out of the frying pan, right into the fire. Alan Katz believes that a shot of history in every glass makes for a better cocktail. Alan's co-founder of New York Distillery in Brooklyn, where he crafts Perry's Tot Navy Strength Gin and Dorothy Parker American Gin. We recently spoke with Alan about starting a new distillery and what makes his gin so special. Alan, I'd like to know how you decided to open your own distillery. Well, it's actually a fairly good story, I think. Uh, I was interested in the broader spectrum of food and drink. And I had a wonderful opportunity many years ago to go and live and work in Italy in a food sense. I was working at a cooking school, and I had never been in such close proximity to the food that we were actually using in the kitchen. I really didn't travel extensively on that trip, but it absolutely piqued my curiosity as to what might be um, an authentic American gastronomy. And over the years, I had many occasions to contemplate that question, and I could really only come up with two genuine answers, one being barbecue of the American South and the other being cocktails. And I went off on the deep end of cocktails. And I had bartended a little bit and I had worked in restaurants, but not with a a penchant curiosity or a focus on why are we selecting this rum above all others for our house daiquiri or what is the rationale for the ratio in a specific recipe. And ultimately, in a desire to, one, work for myself and two, actually be a manufacturer of of something, uh, it, it led me to an interest in distilling. So how do you set out to open a distillery? Well, (laughs) I laugh at myself with that question because the truth is, for me personally, uh, I set out to open a distillery, oh, about 12 years ago. Oh. But I say that with a laugh to myself because the truth is I was playing games with myself for half that time and didn't really get serious about it until about... Uh, five and a half or six years ago. And the truth is I had the good fortune to meet uh, one of my business partners, Tom Potter, whose expertise was really in running a small beverage alcohol business, uh, having uh, originally co-founded the Brooklyn Brewery uh, in New York City. And Tom was the business guy strength, and I was the spirits guy and cocktail guy strength. And it was a very nice... Uh, match. And once we actually did sit down and say, hey, let's work on this together, you know, the road is a little bit slippery. And it was absolutely work. Some of it was hard work, but it wasn't overwhelming. It was a a fairly reasonable road for us to go from concept. It did take a little over two years to go from that point to actually opening the doors to the public. There is a beyond burgeoning community of what I prefer to call boutique distilleries in this country. And at the present, there are probably 600 companies in some vein similar to ours at the New York Distilling Company. And I would bet that two or three years from now, there might be 2,500. Do you anticipate that as a whole they will impact big liquor? That's a great question. And to give it some context from my experience – when we talk about big liquor, the, really the bigger umbrella is the alcohol universe. And I always look at big liquor, as you call it, differently than big wine and big beer. So when we talk about big and little, if you will, in those scenarios, big beer, we could all generally agree, is it's not awful, but it's modest, agreeable, 
rarely special beer. And it's really the craft brewers who have re-engaged a, a beer drinking public with special craft brews. And I would argue that there's similarities in the wine world as well. In the distilled spirits world, very differently, drastically differently, the big distilleries are stalwarts in the industry, and they make some of the most special gins, whiskeys, rums, name it. And there is a quality product, an exceedingly high quality product, that comes from a big liquor player. And so it'll be interesting to see if the rise of boutique distilleries engages some of these larger companies in an antagonistic way. I don't see that happening now for certain. You know, there's a rare occasion of uh, a smaller brand being picked up by a big company. Mm -hmm. But uh, you think it's peaceable so far? I, I know that it's peaceable so far. You know, when we have challenges in our business, whether it's finding barrels to age our whiskey, whether it's questions about specific distilling technique, the the phone lines to the big distillers that we know are open 100% of the time. What was the biggest challenge that you faced opening up New York Distilling? Well, well our business is is really in an, a major urban center. We're, we're in a <laughs> hot part of, of Brooklyn in New York City, and you have zoning issues, of course. Uh, but it's really the, the two areas uh, we're dealing with the Department of Buildings and dealings with the Environmental Protection Agency. And the Department of Buildings simply has codes of how things can be built. And we had decided to take over an existing space that was essentially defunct. And to get it to code uh, was a challenge. And we knew that it would be a little bit of a challenge going in because it was a very raw space. But we didn't quite anticipate uh, how much of a hurdle uh, working with this space and getting it to hmm. the point of acceptability would be. From the standpoint of environmental protection, it's a very interesting thing for me to discuss because there's a personal romance about distilling and cocktails, uh, of course, these days in our country. But the truth is, with very rare exception, distilling by and large is not a sustainably oriented manufacturing process. I can talk all day about how our grains are raised organically, all of our botanicals are certified organic, but the truth is distilling uses a lot of water that ultimately has to go back, in, in our case, into a municipal system and treated, and it uses a lot of natural gas, and those are finite resources. And for us, particularly in the process of making whiskey and being in the middle of a city, you have to do something with what's left over. Now, by tradition, if you were making whiskey in the countryside of the outskirts of Louisville or Bardstown, Kentucky or Tennessee or Virginia, etc., in the Mid-Atlantic somewhere, you would collect those spent grains, that spent mash, and feed them almost adjacent, perhaps, to your distillery, to your cows or your hogs, as slop, as nutrient-rich food. Well, when you're in the middle of the city these days, there's no animals to feed, obviously. And, um, you know, we have to do something with that. So another expense that, from an environmental standpoint, is not uh, a, a closed concept, if you will, and that we have to have it trucked away. And it does ultimately go to farm animals, but it, we still have to come up with reasonable ways and semi-cost-effective ways to have it removed. That's fascinating. So you begin the New York Distilling Company, and the first products you begin working with are gin. Why gin? We started with gin for two reasons. One, if you go back to the first golden age of American cocktail culture, it's really the 1850s, 60s, up until Prohibition, the mainstay white spirit was gin. And so one on one hand, we like celebrating that. We like bringing some new ideas to gin and some old ones that, that really haven't been thought about for some time. Uh, but the other is very honestly a business decision where almost from the moment we started, we began distilling and barreling rye whiskey. But we wanted to age it for a reasonable amount of time. So... 
you know, from a revenue standpoint, you've got to have some streams of revenue to keep the doors open. We're able to make gin and essentially have it in a bottle in a matter of several weeks as opposed to several years. So that was a very smart economic decision. And you combine history with gin in a very interesting way. And so I'd like you to tell us about Perry's Tot Navy Strength Gin first. Sure. Well, this was really the, the first example and the prime example of us trying to create a product that was purposefully different. And prior to releasing Perry's Tot, there had not been a Navy Strength Gin commercially available in the United States for nearly a century. And most people hadn't heard of it, bartenders included. And the fun story, factual story, is that Navy Strength Gin, and rum for that matter, were created by the British in design that if by accident or otherwise you spilled your booze on board ship, you could still fire off your cannons. And people say, why does that matter? Well, the officers were paid with alcohol. And in the old days, and I mean the very old days, the 1700s, etc., you had a lot of casks of alcohol on board ship. And if you got caught with your gunpowder rendered useless, you ended up at the bottom of the Atlantic or the bottom of the English Channel. And so they devised that a higher-proof spirit would prevent this from happening. For us, the more important fact that in research, going back 100 years to the turn of the 1900s, Navy strength gin was wildly popular in cities along the East Coast, from New York to New Orleans to St. Louis and San Francisco, from the standpoint of usage in cocktails. And so we thought if we could devise a recipe, and again, this is at 114 proof, or 57% alcohol, that if we could devise a recipe that resulted in a reasonably smooth gin, that we could then sort of garner interest in presenting it as a cocktail ingredient. Now, I'd like to move on to your other gin. All right. The bottom line is, uh, for me personally, I wanted to name a product for a woman and could think of no better woman to name a product for. Particularly a gin. Particularly a gin, and that's Dorothy Parker. She was, as I imagine her, far more of a broad uh, <laughs> than a lady, and that's just fine by me, but she was a damn good drinker, and I think that was, for us, without being flippant about it, worth celebrating too. This is a more contemporary style gin. Both of our gins are heavy with juniper as a backbone of, of the distilled spirit. Uh, and then they have some spices like coriander and a little bit of cinnamon or uh, star anise or green cardamom pods, depending on which gin. Uh, and we balance that out with a little bit of citrus always, of course. Uh, but in the case of the Dorothy Parker gin, we have what we would call uh, two contemporary botanicals. One is elderberry, and the other is dried hibiscus petals. And on the nose and palate, if you just taste it neat, it gives it a floral or fruit-forward quality. The key for us, coming from a, a cocktail background, is its versatility in making mixed drinks with it. That's all that matters. And that when you make any manner of gin sour or the equally popular bitter-esque style of cocktail, like a Negroni, that in both cases, that fruit or floral quality just recesses to the background and makes for a very well-balanced cocktail. That was New York Distillery co-founder Alan Katz. Next time you're at a bar, try ordering a Negroni made with Dorothy Parker gin. It's the next best thing to having a cocktail with Dorothy Parker herself. I begged of a star to throw me a beam or two. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Tune in next week when we go into the vineyards to pick some grapes. We did give you orange gloves, so if there is an accident... You'll see the blood come through the glove. No, but but, <laughs> but if, if the, the finger does get detached, it's much easier to see with an orange glove on. Subscribe to our podcast. Hear today's show or catch up on previous editions anytime online at itsneworleans.com. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Rouse's Markets, and Zatarans. 
Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by Dickie Brennan and Company and Linda Green, the Yakima and Lady Soul Food Catering. Our media sponsor is Louisiana Life Magazine, the magazine of a great state. Original theme music by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Thanks to executive producer Thomas Walsh and sound engineer Joe Schreiner. I'm Poppy Tooker. We'll see you next time. Louisiana Eats is a production of WWNO and the University of New Orleans.